of the um, Gyres team, it's um, it's really an honor to be back, um, especially thank you to Konstantinos, John, and Gerhardt for um, organizing this again. Um, I had I had such a lovely time last year, and um, I was very I'm very honored to um, be joining you again. Um, as as uh, as Gerhardt uh, said, my my topic is on uh, uh, making a case for necessary incompleteness. And um, in the spirit of that, I'd originally planned to have a slide deck to accompany this, but um, time, uh, we're, we're just finishing up our, our last uh, week of classes and uh, we've had a stomach bug going through our family. So that part of the presentation will be necessarily incomplete. So I hope that I am uh, engaging enough to, um, <laughs> with the lack of visuals. Um, so I'll begin. There's an apocryphal quote attributed to the famed film and theater director Orson Welles, where um, he said, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. And I guess I never really realized how much I subconsciously approached my work as a teacher and theater maker through a virtue of completeness or um, uh, the, the presence of those limitations until the, the pandemic arrived. Now, to be fair, I credit this view as something that was cultivated by my experiences in academic and theatrical spaces that have up till now been largely transactional and necessarily complete, especially in terms of thinking about it in, in capitalist um, uh, ideology. I inherited much of my early pedagogy from my time in graduate school as a TA for a large lecture course. Three times a week, I watched as a more senior graduate student conducted each class as performative, controlled, self-contained episodes of a well-crafted 16-week arc that took students from point A to point B in their educational journey on their path to graduation. This graduate student was charismatic and enthusiastic. The lectures were entertaining and dynamic, but the course left no real room for the students to be themselves or participate in any meaningful way. In Torben Beck Dreiberg's The Circular Structure of Power, Politics, Identity, and Community, he writes about a conception of power that is asymmetrical, and he calls it power over. So power over dynamics stress power that entails um, conflicts of vested interests, that um, power struggles are inherently zero-sum games where there are winners and there are losers, and that power secures its compliance or control over others by hierarchical relation of inequality. If you think about like a, rise or a tree, an arboreal structure. Um, so I essentially learned how to be a teacher by someone who practiced power over in the academic classroom. Only later in my academic work, uh, while I was working on a directing project in graduate school, did one of my professors present an alternate model of thinking about power. Beck Dreiberg would call it power two. Um, this professor reminded me that in theater in its most pure form works best in rhizomatic or um, symmetrical communal dynamics of power, favoring collective consensus over conflict. And as a director, I should make myself as obsolete as possible, as soon as possible, in order to help make some of that space for others. Contemporary models of theater and academia have been built on these concepts of power over. When we look at both of these institutions today, at least in the United States, we see that they mostly reflect the same system of operations. Administrators, many, many layers of administrators, work very hard to keep their theater or university financially operational and accomplish this by making programming or curricular decisions that they hope will get the most patrons or students in their institution while also pursuing grants and donations to meet the rest of the institution's needs. At each level, administrators are making choices with arguably the best of intentions. They want to stay open. However, they're replicating a top-down model that prioritizes survival over creativity, risk, and true progress, and instead awards administrators with greater financial security than those that they employ. A theatrical production almost always begins with its in-process in mind. We have an open night, a, a, a clearly defined time and, and space in which the artistic product will meet hopefully a paying audience. Whether it's ready or not, there is this mindset that the show must go on. And post-secondary education too has gravitated toward the promise of an end. For students, it's graduation. For educators, it's the um, ever tenuous dangling promise of tenure. We laugh knowingly about phrases that students use like C's get degrees, or that we ourselves and our colleagues use this idea of publish or perish or up and out but we also metastasize them in our behaviors. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began in early 2020, many of these processes that favor completeness have remained woefully inadequate to confront the realities and the nuances of the past two years. In addition to two years of shifting among online, hybrid, and in-person classes, 
Many faculty and staff and students have experienced and have largely let to, yet to reckon with pandemic related trauma. Everything from deaths within their families or friend networks to managing their own health needs. Insecurity around their finances, employment, housing or food, and even deep rooted feelings of moral injury, which are the residual feelings of shame, guilt and disorientation that come after being forced into situations that violate your ethical code particularly in response to the seemingly elastic rules that govern pandemic safety. We haven't had enough proper time or structure to individually or collectively grieve, mourn, disappear, or even reflect. Each of us is carrying a heavier than normal allostatic load, which um, uh, neuroscience says is the physical wear and tear on our bodies when we're forced to adapt to chronic stressful situations. Essentially, the wounds that we've all suffered have been have yet to be named, acknowledged, or healed. Because it, once we do that, they remain in our bodies, our hearts, our minds in ways that degrade our well-being and our humanity. But there's one thing that's been made clear to me, at least this past academic semester. Our institutions are champing at the bit to return to normal, to have those sen that sense of completeness come back to the post-secondary uh, 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 landscape. But this is happening whether or not their constituencies are ready for or reconciled to this fact. On my campus, our administration has insisted that our student body comes to college because they want to be in person and they want to be challenged. But at every turn, they, the administration has seemed hesitant to actually challenge students because of a very real possibility that they might break. All of this underscores the most important notion that, that, that goes back to the, the title of my talk. Amidst all of these processes pushing us back towards these completionist models that we had pre-pandemic, none of us are complete right now. Over the past few years, the pedagogy of theater making in particular, a, a, a discipline that by definition requires shared space, has been at times impossible. The questions of how can one remotely teach acting, especially when one's pedagogical approach centers on physically driven forms of exploration, is it possible to gauge basic performance skills in those situations, much less more intrinsic notions like nuances of breath and timing, intention and gesture, or obstacles or objectives or tactics when you're dealing with Zoom lags or subpar speakers or students that are hesitant, unable or uncomfortable to turn on their camera? And then most importantly, how could we as human, humanitarians teaching in the humanities Claim to be guided by the principles of equity and humanity when our students were struggling to secure access to stable Wi-Fi or um, navigating a slate of new devices and apps or dealing with inequitable living environments. Although some degree of in-person theatrical performance has returned to post-secondary institutions across the country and the globe, our, our own institution has done so this year, there are those of us that teach and create theater uh, that continue to wrestle with the cumulative impact of these several years of disruption to our industry, our students, and our individual practices. Our, our, our practices have been beset by production delays and cancellations, reconfigured courses, and there have been several cohorts of student performers and designers who've graduated during the pandemic who lost opportunities to completely develop their skill sets or even properly showcase their creative work. And the incoming classes of students have displayed characteristics of severely atrophied studied and performance skills due to the shift of remote learning in their final years of high school. Workloads were made lighter, deadlines became fluid, vocal and facial expressions were dampened behind masks and via screens, and performance opportunities for those students also completely disappeared. They were necessary adjustments, of course, but they left many of these processes incomplete. This necessary incompleteness comes with a great cost. As a colleague of mine noted, um, as we were discussing this semester, the student populace that we're working with right now are essentially missing two years worth of development in their abilities to prepare and execute live performance. Depending on the resources available at the schools that they attended, that could be anywhere from four to 16 performances that they just don't have in their bodies or in their, their, their minds. When, these, are, these are performances where the foundational knowledge of dramatic material and performance styles get introduced to them, where their work ethics are built and defined and honed, where amateur mistakes are made and addressed in really relatively safe spaces, and where the trajectories of future careers are ignited. And of course, our performance and design faculty too are missing those shows, along with having our research agendas and creative trajectories severely disrupted. 
The continual pivots in instruction modality led many of us to develop habits that may no longer work now that we're venturing back into classrooms. And the pressure to prepare our students for the professional world looms ever more present as we take on the unnecessary demand to make up for the lost time that our students have. Especially in a historic moment when our country is essentially upside down and our faculty burnout rate is excessively high. And yet, yet, this rupture, this disruption has opened space for reconsideration of many outdated artistic traditions, which are largely rooted in unfair capitalist labor practices, as well as sexist, ableist, and white supremacist ideologies. The theater, at least in America, has systemic issues that have been increasingly visible over the past decade. Movements ranging from Occupy Wall Street to hashtag Me Too, to Black Lives Matter, to bans off our body, have all manifested in new demands from the theatrical industry to address and reform longstanding practices that have engendered generational harm. Organizations like We See You White American Theater and the, um, the Emergent Theatrical Intimacy ed Education have been instrumental in opening up the ways in which these traditions and practices can be interrogated and dismantled. But these are not quick solutions as they were built over years and decades and, and, and centuries. Addressing these problems demands continual engagement and sacrificing of these comfortable, complete ideas that envelop our industry. Plus, this current crop of students that I teach is a class of activists who really have shown that they have no time or patience for the inaction on the part of the theater industry to immediately address issues like racism, sexism, and ableism, and the other issues around identity that are, that are inherent to the art that we consume and create. So, as I considered ways over the past couple of years to confront these ideologies in my classrooms and directing projects, I wondered if we're gonna make art in such an uncertain moment, it was it possible to lean into this idea of necessary incompleteness and use that to leverage and unlearn the bad theatrical habits that I inherited in my own training and in doing so keep from passing them down to my students. I'm gonna outline a few of the attempts that myself and our department have engaged with to create some uniquely incomplete results. And then I'll reflect on some of the, the merits and um, some of the, the hardships that have come in engaging in this process. The first one is, is called an imagined performance. So in spring 2020, I was directing a production of, of Nine to Five, the musical, and it was slated to open April 3rd, 2020, which was two weeks after our spring break. In response to the ever-shifting university response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the show's opening night first was delayed two additional weeks, then momentarily moved to our fall semester before being canceled that summer as it became apparent that another wave was coming and we would be dealing with a largely online semester. Even after realizing that the industry nor the moment could provide us a legal or a safe way to rehearse and remount our long delayed production, the decision to cancel it was a particularly devastating one, especially for my students. As I was, um, as I was reflecting on that, um, I was inspired by a call to fellow disheartened theater makers by um, Rachel Anderson Rayburn, who is an assistant professor of theater at Franklin and Marshall College here in the United States. Um, she called for all of us who had had shows canceled to uh, create imagined performances of those shows. What, I, um, what that ultimately looked like for us was uh, we created an online repository where we had any analog or digital remnants related to the production that were created um, prior to or in response to the interruption of the show with the, the, the pandemic. This imaginative digital space, which um, we designed as an online journal, uh, was designed to emulate the look and the feel of a shopping catalog from 1979, which is the year that the show is set. And it served as our company's collective memory in this unprecedented process of making and then unmaking our production of nine to five. The emphasis was put on um, the production team and the designers to provide material that was reflective of the incompleteness of our production work. As a result, the site, which we still have live and active, is full of incomplete and in-progress detritus. These are scenic models, costume mock-ups, choreography videos for the show that never uh, was, were mounted, social media posts, and production-specific memes that were generated by our students. It was a final opportunity for graduating students to showcase their creative work. For our design faculty and production team, it was an opportunity for us to document our research and our professional practice. And for our departments, uh, it became our department's alternative celebration for our uh, in necessarily incomplete journey to opening night. 
I was proud at the company's response when it was unveiled at our what would have been opening night Zoom party that April, and it provided all of us a very specific theatrical sense of catharsis. This collective act, this thing that we created together in the wake of something else we were creating disappearing, allowed all levels of collaborators some sense of closure in a time that was acutely rife with loss. Another aspect um, that, that, that's more pedagogical in approach um, is something I discussed at last year's um, Gyrus conference. During the early stages of online teaching, several faculty in the Department of Music and Theater at Iowa State devised and deployed class menus in several of our courses. Class menus are essentially rooted in the pedagogical strategy of differentiated instruction, which aims to address inequality in student preparation, interest, and strength by offering them a variety of learning pathways within the same classroom that can differ in terms of content, focus, out activities, or outcome. The course menu, in essence, is, is a flexible way for students to demonstrate achievement through personal choice and autonomy while still meeting the outlined course objectives. In, 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 in practice, to receive a satisfactory grade, students get to choose from a selection of assignments curated by the instructor that are then weighted by points based on the perceived time or labor investment required to reach the intended outcome. The suggested out assignments then um, have guidelines for productive participation in the course and not necessarily perceived as hard or easy, but instead presenting multiple optimal paths for students to reach the point threshold that's established as satisfactory. This motivates students to consider their interests, to explore different ways to demonstrate achievement within course material. And in a nod to this idea of necessary incompleteness, I encourage my students to remember that they didn't have to complete every single assignment to exceed the point threshold. For my musical theater performance class, which at the beginning of the pandemic seemed like a near impossible class to port directly online, students thrived in choosing the ways in which they wished to engage with the course for the rest of the semester. Some of them loved the weekly discussion posts about what they were up to during quarantine. Some of them uh, tapped into their inner uh, musical theater playwrights by rewriting lyrics of popular musical theater songs into COVID-19 related public service announcements. Others, collaborated with their, uh, with their, with their cohort uh, from a great distance and filmed their own lockdown musical theater performances. Some of them solo, some of them in partnership with their peers, which then we were able to share with our department's social media accounts and connecting them with an audience, albeit virtually. Um, on the heels of uh, the cancellation of nine to five, our department began to pl planning for the 2021, 2020-2021 uh, season. Um, at that point, um, as I was still sort of negotiating the emotional fallout from my students and my own uh, uh, work disappearing, I felt completely incapable of helming a project that would most likely be derailed by another COVID spike. And I was, in essence, at a completely creative nadir. And after a summer of delayed or canceled internships and production opportunities and what looked like to be a fall semester of ex exclusively Zoom theater, student morale was also at a nadir. So taking all of that into consideration, I pitched a project that would um, uh, allow me the space that I needed at that point, but also would allow our students an experiential learning opportunity and have a way to have a say in the season. And that was the, having an idea of a, a festival of student produced work. Our department had previously had opportunities for student directors to showcase their work in this way, but I advocated for an even more holistic approach for students to engage with and practice their artistry in multiple different disciplines. With four entrepreneurial students working alongside me as associate student producers, we shaped and coordinated a festival that featured 10 original pieces that were wholly created by our students. The slate of offerings were as diverse as our students' interests. We had several original plays, a monologue with puppetry, a song cycle that had original choreography choreographed by a student, a music video that used the acting for the camera class that we had just deployed, and even an animated short with an original score. The stories touched on a variety of topics like mental health, strained friendships, loss, and familial legacies, themes that seemed very salient to many of our students as the pandemic had raged on nearly a year. Duties were spread across 38 student participants, many of whom were tackling multiple roles in performance, design, production, writing, and direction. The production was offered exclusively as a live stream to our audience, which mer merged pre-recorded elements with a few live performances that were broadcast from our audienceless theater. The festival ultimately was a resounding success for student growth. 
Many first-time writers, first-time designers, first-time stage managers, and first-time producers gained vital industrial experience in, again, a really relatively safe space where they were bolstered by a lot of support. It was also a resounding success for our students seeing themselves in their artistry in a way that they had not before. And the, their plans for a more extensive student fringe festival in works for next year's uh, season um, at our department. Another idea that, is, that, that has come forward is this idea of community agreements. Although I work in what is nominally the Department of Music and Theater, um, the two halves of the department have historically operated exclusively of one another. But in 2021, our department chose a new chair, our former director of theater, who has really sought to bridge the gap between the two parts of the department and cultivate a new community and culture. However, with a much larger body of faculty and staff, we quickly realized that each time we would gather together as a group, there were a radically different number of bodies in different spaces at completely different times during the day. And thereby we were almost as a department necessarily incomplete. At each gathering, whether they're faculty meetings, committee meetings, class sessions, or rehearsal processes, we've set the intention to create equitable and inclusive spaces. But to help us achieve this, when we have, again, have different makeups of different groups and different constituencies, we began using what are called community agreements. If you're not familiar with community agreements, they are ground rules that at the beginning of any, um, at the beginning of any meeting or process, publicly establish the expectations for how the group wants to communicate with each other and how we might ad address conflict if it arises. The community agreements usually cover behavioral expectations, respect for boundaries, and any specific considerations that individuals need to feel comfortable or be heard. A lot of these times, um, uh, some examples of, of community agreements might be ideas like um, turning off cell phones so that there's not that disruption, um, respecting each other's boundaries. Uh, another one is called one mic, one voice, which means that one person is speaking at any given time and that we give res respect to that. Another um, uh, kind of comically named one is called don't yuck my yum or don't yum my yuck, which is whenever somebody expresses an interest or an affinity for something, um, avoiding the uh, temptation to say, oh, well, I don't like that or, oh, that's not great. Uh, trying to avoid any sort of direct um, uh, condemnation of, of things that, that are expressed interest uh, uh, for, for other members of the group. And this, this, um, this ideology is sort of spilled over into our classrooms too, which regularly establish community guidelines and allow us to spend more time in class on community building exercises and more authentic group discussions than even in pre-pandemic levels. Students too have started to utilize them in their own rehearsal processes and the spaces in which they gather. All of us, students, faculty, and staff members alike have benefited from this more informed community of care that's rooted in kindness and compassion. This past year, disappointed with the less than revolutionary state of musical theater, but with a departmental request to helm a musical theater project in our past season, I put out a call to the theater community in summer 2020, uh, 2021 for musicals to workshop. So workshopping in theater terms is a necessarily incomplete process. It gives playwrights, producers, and composers a chance to develop and improve their material before ever attempting to scale it up to a full production. Most musicals on Broadway go through multiple workshop processes. They can help us test the story tone and style, learn if material is ready for actors and singers, write new pages or songs, and finally gauge how audiences are reacting to the story as a whole. It was, like the Student Produce Festival, a process that we had not yet engaged with at Iowa State University Theater, but would give our students better insight to a common industry practice. When I put out that call, I anticipated that we might get two dozen submissions of works in progress. We ended up with over a hundred of them. My fellow faculty and I winnowed our workshop selection to one project, a, a musical, a new musical called Baba, a revolutionary climate crisis driven musical retelling one of Russia's oldest and most potent fairy tales about Baba Yaga, written by New York uh, City-based uh, Jessica Kokoska and Elia Heifetz. The core of the musical is a story told through the eyes of Sylvie, a teenage girl with a passion for the environment who must earn the trust of the famous Russian witch in the woods, Baba Yaga, who's in exile from her home, Russia, to foil the plans of her new crunchy yoga stepmom who secretly comes from an industrial family bent on raising the forest for energy. You know, that old story. The musical puts a uniquely contemporary spin on familiar Russian fairy tales 
with a score that ranged in style from classic folk to old Soviet bloc standards to even a few highly produced TikTok-esque pop songs. But we're all wrapped around a question that urgently applied to our industry, our sense of self in this moment, and the threat of potential global conflict. The question, what do we do when our own forest is under threat? This project, which was revolutionary to many of our on our campus, promised to be a real-time experience, allowing our students to craft and shape a new piece of musical theater along with the professional librettist, composer, choreographer, music director, design team, and our other collaborators. It fit into our departmental ethos of training citizen artists with its climate themes, allowing for outreach to sustainability groups and organizations on campus and within our local community. And we were able to schedule the librettist and composer for a week-long on-campus intensive residency where they collaborated alongside the students in rehearsal, visited classes, and provided professional insight to our undergraduates. And the experience was bolstered by the creation of an advanced musical theater seminar for our students where they were able to enroll in and get credit for their work. Preparing for the final production, which just went up in April, um, we received the final script only 18 days prior to opening night. This whole process challenged our students in un unexpected ways. Despite my constant pay on to necessary incompleteness at the start of the process, it became clear early on that the students had no idea what that meant. The company had expected our final project would be essentially complete, a fully staged production like we had done so many times before. So when I announced the plan to keep scripts in hand and use music stands on stage, which are common sites at developmental workshops, the students nearly revolted. However, after a few calibrations of our expectations, we ultimately arrived at a final project that was a tremendous success. We did ultimately end up with a nearly fully realized production of a brand new musical, but it also had those support structures there for students to, to create, uh, to, to engage in their artistry with very little time and ultimately engage in a process that at the end was by their definitions, a little bit incomplete. So up until this year, ISU Theater's normal season has consisted of six main stage shows, which ultimately resulted in a schedule that was not sustainable nor rooted in healthy, equitable, or inclusive practices. In response to our faculty concerns over burnout, ISU Theater formed a season advisory committee in the fall of 2021 in order to investigate the previous formulas, assumptions, and circumstances that have driven our season selection processes over the past five years. The committee identified a lot of large scale problems. The process was largely insular and relied predominantly on a faculty member saying, I wanna do this project and the rest of the faculty saying, okay, cool. The, this whole entire ideology was handed down from previous leadership and did not align with our present goals of promoting healthy citizen artistry and the work-life balance. It did not leave room for us to reimagine our season planning and our standard theatrical practices. Many of us over the pandemic have been interrogating these questions in our own research and our practice. And we were uncomfortable with the notion of trying to go back to the old or normal or traditional unsustainable way of doing things. And it did not acknowledge the many other educational activities, class showcases, student productions, dance and music collaborations and other demands on resources that were actually happening within the season. Our season as a whole was presenting itself as an incomplete process. So the committee, after, after discussing this, advocated for an entirely new process, aimed at creating a more open, transparent, responsive, and innovative approach to season selection. So starting with our 2022-2023 season next year, our department initiated a multi-year planning approach bolstered by a new set of season selection values that better accounted for allocating departmental resources, meeting student learning outcomes, allowing for diverse representation on our stage, and taking account of human capital. In this new system, a project can be submitted by any faculty, student, staff member, or member of our local community for consideration in a future season, and integrates a process of feedback from multiple campus constituencies. Plus, our concept of a season has been broadened to not only consider fully produced plays or musicals as we have in the past, but also considering new work development, lectures, guest artists, cross-disciplinary partnerships and projects on campus and off campus, and other course-related showcases. No any one project meets every value set forth by the department. 
as we reviewed submissions this year, each piece that we've chosen to be a part of our season for next year is a necessarily incomplete representation of our departmental ethos. But by careful selection of projects that complement one another and fill in some of those gaps, holistically, we've been able to build a season that can eat, meet each one of our season values at least once, if not multiple times. From this process, I've realized that many of the adjustments that I and our department have made can be seen through this same lens. None of the projects or policy changes that I've mentioned um, earlier addressed every single problem that we're facing. But viewing them in retrospect, which this, uh, the invitation to this plenary has allowed me to do, we've managed to increase its experiential learning that's emphasized student agency and in industry preparation. We've allowed for our courses to be redesigned to more closely um, align with students' lived experiences and prospective careers. And in many cases, we've shifted systems, the ones that we have control over, away from power over mindsets to power to mindsets. So I admit that many of these aspirations and projects may sound pedagogically and philosophically admirable, but in practice, it's been exceedingly difficult. Don't let my rosy uh, view of it uh, uh, take away from that fact. While I've outlined many successes for our departments um, in this presentation, I do feel it prudent to recognize several factors, contradictions, and limitations that have at times worked against this advocacy for incompleteness. So number one, the definition of necessary incompleteness is kind of incomplete. My definition of incompleteness I found is not always the same as my students or my colleagues. Even when I've clearly articulated expectations, the potential for miscommunication in this process is very, very high, especially with student populations who are um, uh, suffering from a detriment of uh, experience and knowledge about the industry. But I've actually found that incompleteness is rarely the problem. It's usually this idea of inconsistency. As long as you're consistent, most, most of the, your collaborators will roll along with you. The second um, big, big uh, uh, block has been the prevalence of industry standards. Because the American theatrical system is built upon that trickle down programming model from Broadway productions down to the regional and um, local theaters, audiences, even my fairly radical students and colleagues, um, have been exposed to and expect a fairly limited and traditional outcome when we go and see theater. Anything that falls outside of that narrow or familiar band of work is immediately read as suspect or less than. Problem number three is the allostatic load problem. This idea that I talked about earlier that our, our bodies have maladaptive ways of responding to chronic stress uh, situations. Universally, research has shown that there are three main factors that lead humans to experience um, uh, at, and read situations as, as adverse or stressful. That is uncertainty, a lack of information, and a perceived loss of control. And guess which three feelings tend to manifest the most when there's no sort of explicit goal for what completion of a project looks like. Number four, the pandemic learning loss in my students' skill sets. Um, in, in many cases, as I, as I alluded to, students are coming in at a detriment. And ultimately, you have the, the aspects of my practice where I felt the strongest need to sort of pull back or ask questions or tear down aspects have sometimes been the places where my students needed me the most to lean in and explain why. So I have to remember that you have to learn the rules in order to break the rules. Problem number five is the political landscape in America. Here in Iowa in particular, majorities of conservative lawmakers fill both chambers of our state legislature and our governor is Republican and all have been fairly hostile to educators at all levels of late. Discussions of abolishing tenure at state funded universities, which I, uh, my institution is, um, also then requiring faculty to disclose political preferences and even going so far as banning discussions of a list of specific divisive concepts have occurred in our state house over the past few years and continue to rage on. And problem number six, which is, um, which is maybe the most holistic is, is that making art and teaching in uncertain moments means that everything takes more time. The familiar time frames and, and, and schedules and um, sets of deadlines don't work anymore. Each subsequent semester seems to have um, been an even more endless cycle of accelerated rhythms of life and once in a lifetime or historical upheavals. We may be tossing out the show must go on mentality, but in its absence come many variables that can derail an evening of rehearsal or performance or even a well-planned syllabus. 
In all of these moments, I've come to draw great pedagogical inspiration from a quote by theater maker Anne Bogart. She says, you cannot create results. You can only create conditions in which something might happen. So my hope is that in this moment of necessary incompleteness, that myself and my fellow educators are creating the conditions for some measure of post-traumatic growth over the next few years. And teaching our students the most important thing of all, that they have the power to determine which legacies of theatrical education deserve to be broken and which ones deserve to be passed on to their future students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Murphy, for this uh, very detailed um, presentation of your work. And um, obviously you teach um, a very specific subject, theatrical studies or performance studies, and you have touched upon a, a whole range of aspects uh, you and your students went through during these uh, two or three years. Um, well, at this point, can I ask people to ask questions uh, or uh, make comments? Or is there anything that uh, you would like to ask Professor Murphy, um, which has maybe not become clear enough? John, uh, for example. Sound. Sound. OK, am I there? Am I there? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very well presented presentation. Uh, you can tell you come from theater a bit, you know, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and now you deliver it. That's good. You performed, right? It's good. Um, yeah. I, I thought in the presentation, you defi defined very well what, what you were after, the incomplete. What remains unclear to me, and I'm coming, coming to this from what I do, which is cultural history, is what you mean by a completist, completionist model, a completionist model, because that seems to be the opposition that you're opposing you know, in terms of what you're doing. So what is a completionist model? Could you expand on that, please? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I, in, in, in my mind, a completionist model is sort of that, um, maybe even goes back to that, um, uh, in, in thinking about uh, Paulo Freire's uh, banking model of education, this idea that we transfer a, a set of uh, predetermined curricular ideas or um, industrial complexes and, and, and transfer that to students that sort of then at the end of a course you say done and then a next, the next class moves in to, to sort of engage and, and, be, and be receiving of that, those ideas. Um, and those are, um, those are certainly ideas that I've felt have been very um, prevalent in our industry, this idea that there are methods of um, uh, of teaching theater that are that are lineage based that are um, there are gurus that then pass down their information and it's sort of it's transmitted directly as opposed to there being any sort of improvisation around it or um, any sort of even editorializing from uh, the, the the teachers that are there or are augmenting those processes that it's it's very clear like a Stanislavski model of theater is passed down very clearly with very specific terms and concepts that are unchanged over time. And so that's sort of what I'm, uh, I think of as a completionist model where in, in, I'm sure in each of our disciplines, we can think of the types of um, courses or um, modes of thinking or uh, uh, colleagues even that operate from those completionist models. And I, my hope is that in, in sort of calling this out, that recognizing that maybe there is, there are, are more of us that are working in incomplete ways than we might want to admit. Because when you talk about a completionist model, it seems to me you're talking about tradition, an inherited tradition. You know, as Hobbes says in Leviathan, what they receive, they teach. So that's kind of repetition of the banking idea. You know, But if, if you're dealing with history at all, um, it seems to me there's a problem with completionist model. Because if you're dealing, say, with you know, the ev evolution of American youth culture from 1960 to the present day. Well, you got to complete it. you got to get to the present day. Or the importance of war in American civilization from World War II to the present day. You've got to go through, you have to complete the, the chron chronologically. The other thing it seems to me is worrying in a way is the class menu idea. Because 
it seems to me there you risk, as you said, the work increased during the pandemic, the stress increased. And if you offer the class menu in a distance learning environment, the amount of work, wow, it just explodes and it already exploded. So it's like an explosion on top of the explosion. Um, and, and people aren't being paid for that, who are teaching, right? They're not being paid for more hours. So what's the good of all it? What's the good of it then? Well, then, and that's, that's a really great question because I had, um, I, I had a uniquely different experience than one of my colleagues who also deployed the class menus. Um, her goal was at every turn to be supportive of students and recognizing that they are under immense amount of stress. And in the first couple of iterations of deploying that class menu, she did not set any sort of clear markers of when the, when students should sort of even be sort of part way through. Um, and she just set the end of the term as the deadline for all of the materials, uh, thinking that students would avail themselves and sort of piecemeal here and there in completing projects. But what ultimately happened was that every one of her students waited until the very end to submit all of their projects that needed to be graded. And so she, I think she ultimately learned a, an important lesson there and, and that, that those of us that deployed those in, the, in, in future semesters sort of created even a, a, a very rudimentary framework around where students should anticipate to be at specific times in the semester. Because you're right, at the, it, it, it can turn into an explosion upon an explosion. And then the kindness and the compassion you're showing to students and giving them extreme flexibility and autonomy comes back to completely burn out the instructor. And so it, it is, it's a process of, 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 of an idea that was rooted in kindness and compassion, but ultimately had to, had to be structured in a way that, where that, that was a two-way street rather than just extending to the students. Good, thank you. Yeah. I don't wanna take all the question time, so please guys. Question from, from my part, um, Professor Murphy, if I understand you correctly, th these two or three years of pandemic um, gave you and your students a new perspective on your work. Since you had to cope with a number of constraints uh, we were not familiar with, of, of course, like uh, lockdown and uh, in your case, cancellations of, uh, of uh, theater performances, et cetera, et cetera. And you mentioned that, um, um, so my impression is, Although this period was certainly very difficult for teachers as well as students, it seems to me that it unleashed, it helped to unleash creativity among your students, which you were not aware of pre-pandemic, -pre basically. Um, and, uh, and, and I assume that most, most students appreciated these, the, this, this, this new freedom or this new, new space they, they, they were given in order to, to create a theater. And, um, um, on the other hand, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned faculty burnout. Obviously, uh, that happened. Did you also did you also experience burnout among students? Students who could not, who had difficulty coping with uh, with uh, the demand for more creativity, if you like. And um, and the next question is maybe this is a bit too much. My question: is, What does coming back? What what does uh, getting back to the to, to to normality? What does that mean for you now, given the experience you had? Those are those are maybe tremendous two or three questions. questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and I'll I'll I'll, I'll attempt to. Long story short, yes, there has been there's been immense student burnout, and it every every semester. <laughs> Our, our faculty have sort of said, this is the hardest pandemic semester. And then the next semester rolls along, and we're like, this is the hardest pandemic semester. Okay. Um, one of the things by and large that was, uh, that, that has been difficult is, um, is sort of getting student buy-in at, at every stage because they have, uh, most of our students that come, um, we, we have a, a very strong, um, high school speech competition that that occurs here in Iowa and most of our students are from Iowa so they've been trained in these modes of like that there's there's a one style and one style of presentation that um, that is pretty prevalent in most of the high schools and so okay. when we okay. have encouraged them to do projects that were 
um, that that were virtual or that were um, that were puppetry based or that are workshop productions. There's sort of like a not they, there's 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 skepticism and there's a a misunderstanding of sort of the goal of those projects, which are okay. antithetical okay. to sort of the fully realized produced spectacle on stage that's there. All right. Um, okay. Another thing that that students have uh, that that um, has, has has continued to happen is that many of our students coming from that model um, are, are 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 scared of their own creativity, are scared of a lack of uh, uh, direction. Okay. That when okay. we say right. you have like you get to collaborate with us on on this, many of them sort of hit creative paralysis and then say, well, just tell me what to do and then I can do that. Okay. So there's been sort of a stymieing of those creative impulses. Um, and, and I think that that comes by and large from the sense of, of, of industry uncertainty, of, of global uncertainty and stress yeah. and that asking them to engage in another sort of generative, uh, project for some of them can be uh can be the, the the straw that breaks the camel's back and and sort of send them just into like a freeze mode okay 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 but, but there are other students that have rel that have that have just like jumped in wholeheartedly and have uh, have been more involved than they were pre-pandemic and so it's really sort of an in meeting students wherever they are at um, which I, I'm sure all of you, have, there are some students that are more engaged and there are a lot of students yeah. that are yeah. less engaged. Yeah. And what does, what does getting back to some kind of normality now mean to you, you know, and given that's been, this experience? That's been, yeah, so that's, that's been another thing that uh, um, our, uh, our, our, our season planning has changed drastically. Rather than doing having a, a, a very packed schedule of six productions that we do each year, we have reduced those numbers. We, we're now going to produce four um, a year. Okay. So two mm -hmm. each semester, which allows for more, um, more lead time for our designers and our performers to okay. get mm -hmm. a show ready. Um, it allows for um, uh, disruptions that may come yet uh, to our schedules. And it, um, it reduces the amount of, uh, of human capital that has to be involved uh, with each uh, production. Okay. That okay. a lot of times we see high engagement for um, the, the shows in the fall and the, the early spring, but then by the time that we hit the last two productions, there's just no, no stamina left. Okay, okay. And so that's awesome. been part of our, is, is, is taking more time as is, is, yeah. is building that into our schedule instead of just going back to, this is the old way that we used to do it and this is what people expect. So this is what we're gonna return to. All right, good, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Christina, yeah. So congratulations for your presentation. I would like to answer, to ask you if you think that for some students, this experience or this process has been an increase in their resilience capacity. Yes, I think, I, I think so. I think um, in those those first couple of semesters that we were dealing with the pandemic, I think there there was this like shrinking of of, of student capacity um, that they were they were just overwhelmed by the number of things new things that they were having to navigate. As we've moved out of that, and as we've returned, um, our our theater community is very close knit within our students and even within our faculty. Um, so I think that as we have all started to gather back in spaces together, there has been an increase in that resilience and stamina and. Um, students have said this was maybe the hardest process that I've engaged with, but I've learned now how to mm -hmm. re-engage mm -hmm. with my craft or learned how to grow within my discipline as a designer or as a, as a performer. We've really tried to include students as much as possible and avoid returning to models where faculty uh, have, have the primary modes of the controls of power, um, but having them uh, more assistance and having them be able to create alongside us, which I think has given them 
better insight as to what might be expected of them later in their career. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Costa, yeah? please go so ahead. I, ca I guess it's a case that, you know, you made it, I mean, the reality made it extremely hard. <laughs> so whenever this finishes, everything will be, will seem easier, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they will yeah, produce two eyes <laughs> yeah. faster um, and better. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's been a lot of innovation. I mean, that, that's the, that's the, yeah. that, you know, the, the, the thing that, Time and pressure create diamonds, right? They, they, we've 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 had we forced ourselves to innovate in new ways, unexpected ways, and so what we what we as a faculty and what our students and what our audiences have seen is that the possibility of the types of theater and the types of of learning that can happen are exponential, rather than sort of just being this more limited narrow scope of that we do a musical, we do a classical work, we do a new play, we do um, a community engaged project that we're able to remix and revise our, um, our skill sets and our offerings in ways that are much more dynamic and focused on engaging with whatever's going on at the present moment. But it has been hard, it's been, it's been very hard. As I told you last year uh, in the previous conference, I found it extremely fascinating and difficult. I mean, we're discussing as educators how it is to educate uh, students, people in general, um, under these circumstances. But educating artists, it's, it's a whole different thing because they are already in a very different thing. It's not like, you know, a pure one-on-one -on -one session or you are telling them something and just writing, I mean, one way or another. Um, and I'm saying that as a historian. So uh, doing art is really, really different. And I think the difficult part, and, and I'm really happy that you shared that with, uh, with Plenary, is that you have to be creative. Creativity, of course, it's you know, certain and, and needed for an artist, but I guess it should be, you know, we should learn as well for non-artists that you have to be creative as an educator in order to you know, all these people, they have to learn something. I mean, it's, your, it's part of your life. It's part of their life. You have to teach them something new, right? Mm -hmm. So I find it extremely important that you use this creativity, that your artistic nature, uh, <laughs> you know, infused you and you, you turn it into something, uh, you know, creative, new. It's, it's unique. John, yeah? John, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, it seems to me that Case of Murphy, that there's an Achilles heel in what you presented. Um, I totally agree about it, helping to release, re release creati creativity. I find particularly with timid students online, there was a, a complicity and an intellectual in intimacy which increased their ability to speak to you because of that online experience. At the same time, uh, who profited from it? I mean, this, the problem with the pandemic and distance learning was a mass, mass issue. And I think of, you know, poor parts of Boston or Cleveland or Houston, et cetera. And in a way, your argument, again, because your, your point of view, and I sympathize with it, was very political. Who does it favor? Who, who, it's privileged. It favors the privileged few. Who profited from online? The privileged few. But something is missing, which is how is this, essentially democratic how does these these qualities that were found spread uh to, to the greater mass of people at all levels being educated in america that's i don't have the answer I, yeah, no, I, I think you you are you hit the nail on the head i mean we've we have we have tried to revise a lot of our, our processes to bring down some of those um, barriers, the gatekeeping that happens around art and especially theater um, in, in, in contemporary culture. Um, but I, I recognize that those have been more outward facing and, and more about getting audiences to connect with whatever we're creating, but it does, it, it, we, we've lost a lot of students that um, our, our department mm. uh, in terms of majors has shrunk from where it was pre-pandemic. We have increased the number of um, 
minors or other students on our campus, which is historically a, a science and technology, uh, a school of science and technology, we've increased the number of minors and um, uh, students that are that are not in the major that are engaging with the work. But um, we we have seen a a, a a a shrinkage there. A lot of the ideas that we are um, uh, the departmental ethos of creating citizen artists and thinking about our art as uh, having an inherently political point of view because art is you know, art is inherently political is different than those conservatory modes where students can go and now get training in acting singing dancing and then um, have a clear trajectory out into the industry that's that's also virtue of the fact we are not a conservatory we are a liberal arts college and sort of mm -hmm. more interested in that holistic yeah. building okay. of a human being but it, there are there are that it is it is an incomplete process because there are a lot of students that are that are being missed yeah good thank you what what i what i find interesting um professor murphy is that uh, this period of uh, disruption uh led as you said to a number of innovations so a crisis that led to thinking uh about things and you and uh, thinking about new opportunities, etc. So I think that find that's quite that's quite interesting. But another another very basic question: Have you ever tried, or have your colleagues tried, or is it possible to teach acting remotely? I mean, is, is this possible on a, using a screen? And <laughs> yeah, and and what there were there were there were several of our our faculty who taught acting foundation or the foundational acting class online and yeah. uh -huh. spent a lot of time uh, dealing with how 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 do you engage physically when our our impulse is to sit here close and and be about yeah. this far from our school um how do you engage physically and yeah, yeah. um that's something that, that we've seen a lot in a lot of our students is that whenever they get into spaces they don't they, they're that that sense of presence is is not there that those of them that have had performance training in the past can sort of have some muscle memory to rely on but uh -huh. students okay. that um, come from spaces that where they haven't had that training are are still sort of like thinking about here or um okay. as as initially the, as masks were were, were um were still being utilized they were only okay. thinking about this okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay everything else was sort of a blank slate um right. We did, okay. we did have an acting for the camera class that got deployed during the pandemic that was a little bit more, um, th that was sort of perfectly suited for the moment because we were talking about relationship for acting between a camera and a performer, yeah, um, okay, where yeah, that okay. transmission of intention only has to go the, the couple of feet or inches. Um, and we were talking yeah, yeah. about sizes. And so I feel like that was a, a much more helpful course for students in those times when we were strictly online, um, okay. but we certainly have felt the the vocal and the physical um, uh, musculature of students yeah. that, that that has atrophied, and we've been trying yeah. to train them back for, for that. Okay, it's interesting. Really interesting. Okay. Well, it's uh Sorry, five just, to, seven. just to uh, just to ask Costa, now you're yeah. saying that uh Kishin. i was thinking that uh now you mentioned about the mask right so that means that you you were forced in a way to let's say uh in a theater there are theater plays that they have no voice right only moves um or vice versa um or uh, you see just some parts of the body because of the of the darkness or something like that so you were forced to work let's say, to have a different approach in, I don't know, in, in, in a new uh, reality with masks. So you actually focus more on the eyes or, or somehow, because, you know, again, it's a, it's a reality that, you know, you see people with masks, you don't know if they smile, if they do whatever they, they do, right? Well, and thinking about too, like the history of theater, um, a, a lot of a lot of forums have utilized masks as uh, as yeah. as a apparent part of the That's presentation. True. 
our our modern realistic style of acting is only you know maybe a hundred years old, but there is this long history of people who have used masks and yeah, um, right. uh, whether they're partial masks or full mask to be able to engage with the channeling of character. And so I think that students have been a little bit more open to those styles in which there is anonymity um, in in that, and that you're able to channel character in a more holistic way that can that can happen i think that those those styles don't feel so far away uh, as they did maybe pre-pandemic um but it, it requires then you to engage with the other modes of storytelling that you can do with your with your with your body or with the items that you have in your dorm room <laughs> um yeah. we saw a lot of creative work where people would use lamps or use um you use lights that they had in their their uh rooms or where they set their cameras, um, that, that they were thinking creatively about space and about um, intention and yeah, thinking yeah. about where, mm -hmm. where those mm -hmm. space is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After all, I think that uh, um, theater students, they, they need to learn how to act in front of a camera as well. As you said, that's part of their, part of their training. Uh, Acting, so yeah, kind of got dipped right in into it. That, that, 